Wednesday evening, and I got home from school and collapsed on the couch from blowing my test, having an argument with my mom, and my car leaking coolant. Again, I had a bad day, to say the least. So, as one does, I strolled over to the freezer and picked up a tub of Briar's vanilla as an attempt to pick me. It was one of those days where the ice cream tub is the ice cream bowl. I picked up a spoon and went to town, devouring and burying the memories of the day. About two minutes into my emotional binge, I was quickly reminded I'm lactose intolerant. Easy to say. My bad day got even crappier. But just like how my colon isn't very tolerant of ice cream, unfortunately, as we look around our world, we as a society are not very tolerant of each other. According to the Human Rights Campaign, hate speech and violent crimes are on the rise exponentially. And more and more, we refuse to hear from the other side of arguments. And herein lies my concern. So today, let's open up our ice cream tub and discover the true inner meanings behind tolerance. Next, we'll grab our spoons and dig in and ask ourselves how the progression of society has been permanently altered by tolerance before finally, we'll identify our problem, set down our ice cream tub, and ask ourselves how we can extend more tolerance to other areas of our lives. So first off, what is tolerance? I'll start off with an easy example. Now, my mom exercises tolerance when we go to a restaurant and her salad still has onions on it. Now, she's allergic to them, so she always orders no onions, but to avoid confrontation, or possibly making the server feel bad about themselves, she eats them anyway. Merriam-Webster Dictionary gives us multiple definitions of the word, but the one that proves the most relevant, at least for our purposes today, is a sympathy or indulgence for beliefs differing from or conflicting with one's own. When we accept that tolerance is simply the idea that we can exist in harmony without harming someone else for their beliefs or identity, we can all coexist in peace. What are some ways that we can apply this to our lives? I'm sure that you can think of specific examples where you can and do apply tolerance every single day. What is a time where you've seen something, anything that you don't necessarily agree with, but ultimately respect it? Tolerance is not for the weak. It takes work and it takes maturity but we can start looking at these everyday examples of how it can be applied to our lives. Like those Thanksgiving conversations that will inevitably end up steeped into politics with your whole family, arguing over whose side is right and why. Or it could be a pleasant conversation where you and your family take turns learning each other's perspectives and respecting one another throughout the difference of ideas. We are identifying facets of each other's identities and deciding that we don't want to interact with someone based on a very simple and minuscule aspect of one's personal identity. Furthermore, we are going out of our way to harm each other. According to the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, or ACLED, anti-LGBT mobilizations such as demonstrations political violence, and other offline propaganda activity have risen to their highest level of data ever collected by said organization. Our place in society is being determined by what others perceive of our identity, and this outlook is abysmal. We are watching this happen right in front of us. But as a society, we feel powerless. I watch every day as marginalized people in my area are put under constant pressure. I recall watching as a disabled classmate has 
another student's school supplies thrown at her head because, in their opinion, she behaved differently. I remember being rudely bumped by individuals at a local event, followed by judgmental stares after others witnessed me holding hands with a girl and the ignorance of our football captain carving the Epsler into a clay bowl in his pottery class because he wanted to gain a laugh from his peers. It's not funny. We are being blinded by our narrow-mindedness. And it is ruining society. And this goes far beyond onions and piety. Whereas being bumped on the street may hurt my feelings or make me feel less than, in middle America, cars are being driven into abortion clinics. Minorities are being targeted and beaten based on harmful and untrue stereotypes. And in the Middle East, Palestinians dodge bombs aimed at innocent people all because we believe our views are the only ones that matter. are literally killing society. So, how do we fix this? How do we as a society move forward? Well, according to diversity.gov, things like mandatory implicit bias training can be a great start. It's been proven that every single person has some sort of bias, and the biases that we hold are at the heart of tolerance and how we react to the world around us. Maryville University states that implicit biases can lead us to depersonalizing people based on perceived characteristics, therefore placing them into stereotype groups. Accepting bias training and a healthy dose of introspection can greatly benefit a more objective and accepting view of others. But that isn't the only step that we can take in the direction of confronting our biases. In fact, the Council of Europe Equity Ambassadors created a little 10 question quiz that each of us can take to see how tolerant we truly are. Questions range from how you would react when a restaurant doesn't provide options for a vegan friend, to how you would react when someone at a baseball game doesn't stand up for the national anthem. But something as simple as a quiz cannot encompass such a vast idea that is tolerance. The first step always includes one's own willingness to change. We have encountered tolerance throughout our lives, and we have been on both the giving and receiving sides of it. I'm sure that you can think of specific examples where you believe our society needs to extend more tolerance, particularly in the elections of the past few years. From casual dislike to hateful rhetoric, we have learned that being tolerant is a fundamental part of our society. It is the key to the world that Martin Luther King Jr. dreamt about, and it is something that each one of us can work toward. So today, we opened up our ice cream tub and we discovered the true inner meanings behind tolerance. Next, we grabbed our spoons and dug in and asked ourselves what tolerance, or a lack thereof, is doing to our society before finally we identified our problem, set down our ice cream tub, and asked ourselves how we can be more because if we work together, we can create the world that every generation has wanted for the future. And hey, that sounds pretty sweet. After graduation, Kenna is planning to attend Ohio University to major in hearing and speech sciences on a track to have a career in neonatal speech pathology. We are so proud of you, Kenna.
qualifier and a two-time state semifinalist, two-time national qualifier, and is currently forced alternate to nationals with her piece, Home Sweet Home School.
reason, so I'm just going to own it. As homeschoolers, we constantly hear how our children won't be socialized. Well, I'll be honest. That is the entire point. They say if you're born into a burning house, you think the whole world's on fire. You peer out windows and see smoke drifting behind mountaintops, but it's too far away. You hear children screaming, think they've come to play. You've never seen a t -t -t fire that wasn't a stovetop flame. And thunderstorms may crash. But you like the rain. Who makes sure the children are being educated? Nobody. In about a dozen states, parents are even required to register. All this despite the fact that we have laws and constitutional provisions that guarantee children the right to education. I was raised in the public school system, and I know what I was exposed to and uh, what I exposed others to. I'll just keep it real. I'm protecting my boys from girls like I was. I don't want any of that socialization for my children. My homeschooling experience was a positive one. I grew up around kids whose moms were chill. I remember being jealous that they maybe had to fit in a few hours of school each day. But I worried about the kids whose parents made even the structure of a daily shower optional. I saw those kids stop schooling at 18. Those who didn't marry immediately seemed lost. What Mean Girls captures so well is the behavior that kicks in when these two worlds collide. When you don't know how to act, you learn by carefully studying what other people do. Mohan nails that self-awareness and nails that stark twin. When so much of social interaction consists of attempting to process socialization, it becomes a lot harder to distinguish between good and bad behavior. My oldest son is dating a girl from Wake Forest! Public school. Ugh. And honestly, I don't like what they teach. I don't like what they're indoctrinated in. Sex, drugs, drinking, rebellion. My kids are not dabbling in any of those, thank you. And I'm on the outside of the greatest inside joke. And I hate all my clothes. Feels like my skin doesn't fit right over my bones, so I guess I should go. Party is done, and I'm no fun. I know, I know. Socialization is about a process that allows you to become you. And my early homeschooling years had nothing to do with me. They had to do with being a mini version of my parents. Why has the homeschooling lobby become so strong? The homeschooling lobby uses extremely aggressive tactics in dealing with state legislatures. If a legislature proposes some kind of increase in regulation, the next day they may find 200 homeschooling parents in their office and the day after they revoke the legislation. Our federal constitution provides children with no countervailing rights to nurturing, parenting, or to education. They have taken the position that the United States should not ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which every other country in the world has ratified. Homeschooling tends to attract parents who value control. Home is not always a happy place. Home is all you have. You don't know any different. Until one birthday, the 16th birthday, the best one. I'm outside with my friends and the sun is keeping my back warm. But I'm not outside and I don't have any friends.
your eyes, you see the burning building and all who live inside. And as badly as you want to return to that white picket fence and big backyard, you cannot. Because it doesn't exist anymore. By the time I left home for college at 18, I was unsure of my ability to survive outside my parents' frame. But then debate came around. Debate was like my own personal great awakening. Debate put me in a position to realize how complex life actually is. And it is far more complex than my homeschooling curriculum tried to trick me into thinking. So if anyone is making you feel guilty over this, don't. No, we can't shelter them their entire lives. We know that they will be exposed to the onslaught of this lost world. But that attack will come after we have given them a firm foundation. The socializing aspect of debate was truly a blessing. It made me, me. No family is perfect, but every child deserves to know that there is a world outside that care. And you wander aimlessly, adrift like the smoke of that faraway mountaintop, down gravelly avenues searching for new solace to cling to. As smoke crowds your lungs, you realize what you should have known all along. Life looks pretty until you realize the truth. The world has always been on fire. You just never knew.
11th, 2023, it was stated that producing the vehicle, the actual body of the car, produces about 5 to 10 tons of CO2 emissions into the environment. And on top of that, the typical 75 kilowatt per hour battery increases by about 7 tons of CO2 emissions. So on top of the 5 to 10 tons of CO2 emissions, combined with the 7 tons from the battery pack, suddenly these electric vehicles aren't so eco-friendly. And considering that they produce so much carbon into the atmosphere, we're destroying the environment by mass producing these cars for our population. But it gets worse, folks. In an article published by the Washington Post on November 11th, 2023, they stated that producing one ton of lithium requires about 500,000 gallons of water to refine into usable ore. And considering that so much water is required, half a million gallons, to refine a ton of lithium, which does not go very far, we have to ask ourselves, is it really worth it? Because lithium is a critical, critical resource in, the producing, in producing these batteries, and without it, we cannot create the electric vehicle batteries, and therefore, they would not be able to run. And so considering that we're using half a million gallons of water just to produce a ton of lithium, we once again have to realize that as of now, electric vehicles will never fully become the norm in the U.S. because we as a nation have not been able to hinder the negative impact or the adverse effects that they have on the environment. Finally, as we, dis or as we arrive at our destination, let's disembark and take a look at the, our deficiencies of lithium. According to a statistic published by Reuters on January 3rd, 2023, they stated that the U.S. has one producing lithium mine that produces a modest 5,000 tons of lithium each year. And once again, that sounds like a very large amount, and it certainly is, but it doesn't go very far at all. In, a, or in an article published by Tesla themselves on May, May 16, 2023, they stated that the Tesla Model S battery contains a whopping 136 pounds of lithium in one battery alone. Meaning that if we wanted to produce a Tesla Model S for car for each person, each licensed driver in the U.S., that would be 33 billion 516 million pounds of lithium that would be required. And that is severely more than the mere 5,000 the U.S. is producing each year. And so considering that the U.S. produces such a little amount of lithium on their own, and we need so much to produce these vehicles, we won't be able to do it. Because once again, we as a nation are not prepared. But finally, as we wait for my car to charge, let's get to the conclusion. Let's carry this all together. If we go back to today's question, will electric vehicles ever fully become the norm in the United States? The answer, once again, is no, absolutely not. And we saw why through three key points of analysis. One, being the insufficient charging infrastructure. Two, being the vehicle's adverse effects on the environment. And three, and perhaps most importantly, being the deficiency of lithium within the U.S. So, as we take a step into the future, let's hope that electric vehicles are improved to be not only better fit for the environment and the world, but the U.S. as a whole. Thank you.
mentioned that this piece deals with mentally disabled person in accidental death. Come on out, Stephen. Take the night, for instance. We get a call from one of the officers doing a routine drive through in one of the neighborhoods over on the west side of town. There was a young boy, 11 years old, dead, found lying in an empty lot. I got the call and immediately drove over. The boy's parents arrived just after the paramedics were putting the boy's body into the ambulance. They immediately identified their son. His name was Tommy. They tell me that they've been looking for their son after, after he didn't come home for dinner. The mother then gives me a few names, addresses, boys he might have played with earlier. I spoke with one family who said the last person seen with Tommy was his friend. Pathway Worldwide says your struggles do not define you. It's okay to not be okay. According to the World Health Organization, there's been a 13% rise in mental health disorders in the last decade. The same source found that approximately 20% of children around the world suffer with a mental health disorder. Dustin is part of this statistic. A teenager with mental challenges, Dustin struggles to fit in with others his age, but still must try to face the consequences when his friend is found dead. In the end, his family finally gets him the assistance he deserves, and they see him simply as Dustin by Leo Kahn. Dustin, I'm Detective Helps. I just met with your parents and I told them you would I would have a little chat in here. It's a little cramped, but it'll give us a little more privacy. So let's get started, shall we? Could you start by telling me your name? You already know my name. You said hello to me when you walked in the room. I, I'm Dustin Farmington. Where do you live? I live with my parents. 1612 Maple. I have my own room and everything. It's decorated with posters of the Avengers, but I've also got some old Star Wars stuff that used to be my dad's. He gave them to me when I was little. I really like Dad's old comic books. I like all the bright colors they use. Do you have any friends in your neighborhood? I've got lots of friends. There's Tommy and, and there's Jared. Sometimes Vin gets to play with us too, but his mother makes him stay home a lot, so sometimes he can't play with us. Tommy just had a birthday last week. He turned 11. I got to go to his party. His parents had a big party for him in their backyard. We all went over to Tommy's house after Tommy's dad got off work. His dad's nice. He's a teacher. He teaches at the high school. He's always trying to teach me something when I go over there. Did Tommy get lots of presents at his birthday party? Sure, he got lots of stuff. Tommy's parents bought him a new shirt and shoes. They were sneakers. They were the coolest pair of sneakers I'd ever seen. They had a picture of Thor on them. Thor's my favorite adventure, and Tommy really liked them. My mom forgot to get me a present to take, so I, I looked around my room for something to give Tommy. He's my best friend. I didn't want to go to his party and not have a present for him, so I gave him one of my action figures. It was the Hulk. The hawk was missing one of his hands, but Tommy said it was cool anyway. He said he would just pretend the hawk was, was born that way. Sounds like you have a lot of fun together. What do you boys play when you get together? Well, we're always playing something. Sometimes we, we play with our action figures. We get pretty rough sometimes. Sometimes we pretend we're cops and robbers, and, and sometimes we pretend we're superheroes. I always want to be a superhero too, but Tommy and Jared and Vin say I'm too big to be a superhero, so I have to be the monster from outer space. Or I have to be the bad guy. I don't like being the bad guy. I want to be the good guy. Do you boys ever get in any fights? Sometimes we wrestle around, but mainly it's Tommy and Jared. They make me be the referee. I'd rather be one of the guys wrestling, but I'm older, so I guess it makes sense for me to be the referee. But 
Tommy said he's gonna be famous someday and he's gonna fight on TV. I asked him if he gets famous and gets to fight on TV if I could be the referee. But Tommy said he thinks that they already have a referee and he was right. They do already have a referee. But then I asked him if I could be the guy who hands him a towel in between every round and Tommy said, it's a deal. And we shook on it. He's my best friend. He's been my best friend since he moved into my neighborhood. I think he was starting kindergarten. I never really liked school. All the other kids got to go to different classes with different teachers and I had to stay in the same room with these two other kids. They were girls and they didn't like me very much. They would call me weird and say that the only thing I cared about was comic books. And they'd call me stupid. They're the ones that are stupid. And they'd pretend to be smarter than me and all just because they could finish their worksheets before I could finish mine. But my favorite part of the day is when Tommy and Jared and Vin get home from school so we can play outside. Your parents mentioned an empty lot a few blocks away. There's this empty lot a few streets over. We went there to play baseball, but then Jared said he wanted to do martial arts. How do you play martial arts? Well, we pretend we're the guys on TV. The ones who fight in a cage. We were all there, and Vin said he would take on Jared, so Tommy and I just sat on this old stump while Jared and Vin put each other in chokeholds and stuff. But Jared's pretty strong, so Vin just kept tapping out. When it was time for me and Tommy to do our martial arts, Vin's mother came to get him. He said that he had to go home and eat. Then Jared said he probably better get home too. That just left me and Tommy. I told Tommy I knew I was bigger than him, so I'd go easy on him. What did Tommy say? He just laughed and said that he trusted me. But then he said a real martial arts guy would just go for it. So we took off our shoes and Tommy put his Thor sneakers over by the street. At first we were just horsing around, but then Tommy said, come on Thor, show me what you've got. So I would grab Tommy and lift him into the air. He'd twist and turn and try to get away from me, but I'd just spin him in circles. Spin and turn, spin and turn. <laughs> I could tell Tommy was getting dizzy because, well, I was getting dizzy, so I decided I'd throw him to the ground. So I spun around three times as fast as I could, and <laughs> I let go of him. <laughs> I fell to the ground, and I was laughing. I looked up, and it looked like the sky was spinning in circles. I'd just lie there and look up at the clouds. I told Tommy to do the same thing. I told him to look at this one and tell me what he thought it looked like, but, but Tommy, he didn't say anything. Tommy, Tommy, get up and tell me what this cloud looks like to you, okay? Tommy, Tommy, his body, well, his neck, it, it looked crooked. There was a little bit of blood coming out of Tommy's mouth. My mom says, whenever you have a cut or, or a bleeding, you have to get a Band-Aid on it as fast as you can. So, so I put on my shoes, and it looked like it was going to rain, so I grabbed Tommy's shoes, too. I didn't want his new shoes to get wet. Then I ran home to get Tommy a Band-Aid. My mom started yelling at me. She said that I didn't finish my chores and I couldn't leave the house until they were finished. I tried to tell her about Tommy, but she wouldn't listen to me. She said she'd make me a TV dinner and I could read one of my comic books before bed. And then you rang our doorbell. Is everything okay? Is Tommy okay? Did his mother get him a band-aid? I... Dustin, I... I want to thank you for being so honest with me here tonight. Listen, I need to speak with your parents for a few minutes, but I'll see if one of the guys up front can rustle you up something to eat. It appears my coming to your house interrupted your dinner, so just sit tight, okay? You're a good friend, Dustin. When I went to the waiting room, Dustin's parents were there trying to consult Tommy's. I spoke with the four of them and I told them what happened. Since then, Tommy's parents have decided to lower, to lower the first degree murder charges against Dustin to unintentional manslaughter under one condition. Dustin is 
placed in a home full of mentally disabled young adults, somewhere he can be among his peers, young men his own age, thereby hopefully eliminating the possibility of a tragedy like this from ever happening again. Dustin, may the force be with you, my friend. May the force be with you. Phallus 
sorry, that is incorrect. No speller may win on another speller's mistake. Mr. Park may the spell next word correctly to take the button of B. Please spell Welt and Chow. Yes, of course. Welt and Chow. W-E-L-T-A-N-S-C-H-A. Is that right, William? You're allowed to win.
Treatments that followed the r and concepts were able to reduce sexual recidivism, violent recidivism, and general recidivism. The principal risk addresses the question, who should receive, who should receive treatment? And Priscilla Malevin quantifies that r and efforts decreased recidivism of people at high risk of offending by as much as 20%. The impact is fixing broken institutions. Taylor in 22 writes that state prison of recidivism rates average around 68% for arrest within the first three years of post-release. This rate increases to 79% and 83% at five and nine years post-release. The main contributor to this is because of the lack of resources or connection to resources that aid prisoners' pro-social integration into the community. Shockley in 23 crystallizes that the failure will always be on the U.S. for not implementing more alternatives to manage crime. Only in the AF world were you ever actually managed the power to stop repeated cycles of oppression and supply a common goal. Unless action is taken to alter our current system, dues will never be fulfilled for those in need and continue injustices destroying society. I stand in proud affirmation and ready for cross.
flat on the rim. As a two distinct impacts. The first is perpetuating crime. Camille King explains that light sentences send the message to the perpetrator that they can get away with it, as well as the message to the sexual assault victim that it's not worth reporting in the first place. By affirming really maximize this dynamic, that sexual assault victims will never be distributed justice, as the oppressed won't be able to actually seek recourse. The second distinct impact is that sexual assault maximizes gender-based oppression. Lynch 22 finds that there are over 730,000 female victims of sexual assault and rape each year that face chronic health conditions, where 94% of women experience symptoms of PTSD or other lingering challenges, causing one third of women to even contemplate suicide. Women in the negative can give proper sentencing to stop oppressors from changing their dynamic that threatens the use of others and invalidates the value of justice. Okay, on my opponent's case. So first, obviously, we hear in the value of justice. However, there's three distinct reasons on why you're always ignoring my criteria. The first of which is that my opponent gives you no extent, threshold, or point line to how we actually promote societal well-being. For example, I could give a homeless person a dollar. We would see that that would benefit their well-being, however, not enough to actually have a proper impact to achieve justice. Second, is that my criteria will always be more encompassing, because stopping structures will always be inherently more important, because this isn't just put a one-time stop to it, but rather the continuation of that oppression. Third and finally, that the oppressed will always inherently come first. The reason why this isn't true on the AC is because equal rules for unequal placers create unequal outcomes. This is the entire thesis of what the NC states, and how specifically the affirmative doesn't actually manage this. Let's go specifically on the contention of the Wi-Fi line. So first on the contention of one, there's four main reasons on why this is wrong. First, their entire contention is contingent on, being, on the idea that rehabilitation is beneficial. However, the entire NC is contingent on one proves you that it isn't, especially in cases of the sexual assault. But second, there's no actual offense for having a right. Sure, for example, we can have a right, like for example, like what I mentioned across. You can have a right to free speech, however, exercising that right isn't something that we should do, especially in times of oppression. Third, inherently, that even if you buy everything the assets of the contention one, it will always be inherently more production in the real world. As specifically McNeil 14 finds, rehabilitation faces a moral problem to coerce people to change, as people are seen more as an object to be accessed, rather an irrespectable consent, and as abuses of the power to punish. Meaning that even if you buy the app that sure, rehabilitation might be beneficial, you always outweigh the means of it, not the end. Fourth and finally, that you place more burdens to those who actually are oppressed. The University of Glasgow explains that unless and until the offender was so-called corrected by the expert, that they would not be treated as a subject and helped, meaning that because the subjectiveness in the criminal justice system creates these sentences, we, do, we ultimately don't know even if people can achieve justice. They completely invalidating my opponent's framework. Let's go specifically on the contention two. So there's two main arguments here. First, that there's no true impact. Recidivism was already high. Use their own tailored 22 evidence against them, because that means that they can have no successful impact. Secondly, I argue that then inherently you can turn the entire point because there's more recidivism in their world. Because when you have lean sensing, that causes more oppression. Let's go to the first warrant of ideology, two specific attacks. First, that once again, the neck doesn't have to defend tough on crime ideology, but once again just prove that there is a better world than what they talk about. On their second warrant, they talk about beneficial structures. Two more issues. First, that you can actually save more money in the negative world because you allow less crime to exist. Sure, you can weigh their short-term impacts, but in the long term, we're still seeing more money saved. Secondly, is that you should actually risk transferring to this, uh, you risk, use their own like risk need responsivity model against them. Because the issue is sure, you take the risk off of those such as the correction officers that are placing it on the victims, but you just dump that right onto the victim. That's the inherent reason why rehabilitation is bad, because then people don't have the ability to seek recourse. Finally, on their impact, there's two main issues here. First, they sure, they can point out every reason why the status quo is bad, but they have to prove to you why the world is inherently better. But second and finally, sure, by every analysis that they can provide to you. We can have things like revolution that might be successful. However, on net, they can't prove to you why it needs to be the primary objective. This then defeats the whole purpose of the resolution, as they can't access any of their key impacts and actually prove to you how we stop the oppressed. Thus, I urge a negative ballot.
changed my life in one conversation. She was 13 years old, a friend's little cousin, and she casually told me that she had met the man that she was going to marry. So I said, okay, tell me about him. And she told me that his name was Harry Styles. So I laughed a bit. And then she said, I know you don't think I'm serious, but I'm actually going to be with him because I love him so much that I would slit someone's throat to be with him. And that was the moment that I became obsessed with fangirls. I didn't know it then, but that moment would go on to transform the course of my life and change everything that I thought I knew about being an adult, being a woman, and being truly happy. We all know about Taylor Swift's Eras Tour, Beyonce's Renaissance Tour, and hopefully an upcoming season of Mania. I'm sure you all know at least one person whose entire life has revolved around one or more of these events. But for me, my obsession is K-pop. Now, I listen to a lot of groups, and I am obsessed with them all. He doesn't know it yet, but me and, the, me and Taeyong from the group NCT, we're kind of in a relationship. Yeah, it's getting pretty serious, actually. Now, I promise you, I may be a huge fangirl, but I'm definitely not the kind of crazy fan we tend to think of when we ponder the word fangirl. Eve Blake discusses this even further in her speech, for the love of fangirls. But before we get started, what is a fangirl? And what is a Harry Styles? Well, according to the dictionary, a fangirl is a girl or a woman who is an extremely or overly enthusiastic fan of someone or something. Now, technically, you can have fangirls of anything, but my specific interest was in fangirls of boy bands because of their somewhat lethal reputation. I remember my dad had told me a story about some Beatles fans from the 60s who had apparently torn a part of BMW to literal pieces because the band had just been sat in it. In the 1960s, the Beatles were the biggest boy band on the planet. But when I met this girl in 2015, the biggest boy band on the planet was none other than One Direction. And Harry Styles was a member of One Direction. Harry Styles is reputed for his compassionate demeanor and his perfect hair. I learned this when I read thousands of tweets about him. I learned that one time he vomited on the side of a freeway in California and that within two hours, fans had turned the site of the vomit into a sacred shrine. I scroll through fan-made paintings of Harry, baby photos of him, paintings of baby photos of him, I watch videos that show me how to create my own DIY love totem for Harry. I read hours of fan fiction, and I fall down the specific rabbit hole of stories that actually place me as a protagonist inside of various romantic romances with him. So in one, I tell him that I'm pregnant with a child. In another, we meet in a hospital. We're both fighting cancer. And in another, we fall so deeply in love that we become fugitives who kill people. But then something unthinkable happens. One Direction, the biggest boyfriend on the planet, loses a member. Zayn Malik quits the band and the internet explodes with feels. I read tweets from girls describing how much Zayn had meant to them. And then I watch videos of 10 year old girls crying. But like, really crying. And then I watch as these videos are reposted, but with new titles that contain words such as crazy and creepy and insane. And suddenly, my YouTube sidebar contains compilation. Fans react to Zayn leaving. Psycho alert. 
century, hysteria was considered to be a legitimate female mental disorder that could be diagnosed by doctors if women displayed excessive emotion or difficult behavior. The word hysterical comes from the Latin word hystericus, meaning of the womb, because it was thought that this condition came from a dysfunction of the uterus. And so treatment for hysteria was a hysterectomy, which is what we still call today a removal of the womb. And at this point, I decide to redeclare my obsession, because I'm no longer just obsessed with fangirls. Now, I'm also obsessed with the way the world talks about fangirls, and the way the world looks at young female enthusiasm. Because I want to know, if girls grow up in a world that casually throws around words such as crazy and psycho and hysterical to describe female enthusiasm, then how does that shape the way that those girls get to be themselves? Secondly, I become obsessed with female screams. Not in a creepy way. I'm talking about those shrieks and squeals at fangirls at concerts. I want to know why Dahlia it is that some people instinctively, instinctively flinch when I merely describe the sound, as if it's painful just to think about it. Then I meet Amy Hume. She's a vocal coach, and she blows my mind. Because she tells me that the female voice between the ages of 11 and 13 years old is one of the most interesting things to study. Why? Because there's this research by Carol Gilligan that says that this is the age when most girls begin to perform and alter their voices. For example, adding breath for maturity, or adding vocal fry for apathy. But you tell me, according to this research, when do you reckon that boys begin to perform and alter their voices? Now, I guess 18, because men mature later, right? Wrong. The answer? that is when boys learn not to cry or not to squeal, that those are not manly sounds. And that's when I realized that a fangirl's shriek is therefore sort of like a superpower. Because it's this fearless and honest expression of pure celebration and joy, and it's a sound that they have not yet forgotten how to make. 
Now with a mouthful, but these two deserve it. Now with their duo interpretation piece, Beetlejuice, the musical, the musical, the musical.
time you read this, I, Lydia Dietz, will be gone. Uh. Who the hell are you? Yeah, you look like a bloated zebra that aligns the part and did a yeet. You can't see me! Or make it I'm gonna jump! No!
number is both astonishing and horrifying. At times like these in the past, we have looked at conflicts so wretched around the world, and they've been categorized into what we call world wars. Today, we are asked to answer an all-important question. Is World War III inevitable and on the horizon? Well, sadly, the answer is yes, due to the conflict-ridden state of our world, the slowing of its economy leading people to become more aggressive, and our own people becoming more divided, leading to less nationalism. Beginning with my first area of analysis. As I stated before, conflicts are happening everywhere, and I'm sure that you've turned on the news and heard all about them. Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, or other arguments between governments are happening everywhere we turn. Now, when we look to the possibility of a third world war, we look at five major players that would come into play, being America, China, Russia, India, and the European Union categorized as one. Now, these conflicts are so important and will affect the world as we know it, but these five countries are not so concerned about these small conflicts. In fact, they're more concerned about the repercussions that will happen after. The Washington Post put out an article late last year that said India is showing full support for Israel in its efforts against Palestine and won't tolerate any further Palestine work. Well, this is the first time in 20 years that India has shown full support for a country. A similar article written by NATO early this year states that if a Russian victory in Ukraine were to happen, it would lead to full aggressive military action. Yes, these large countries are invested in these small conflicts, but they are more concerned about the repercussions and aftermath. They will be looking to the future, where this Third World War is inevitable. When we look at these conflicts, we begin to ask ourselves the root of the problem. Well, the answer is money. Captain America once said, money makes the world go round, but money does not let men win wars. Men are the ones that win those wars. Now, money is a small factor of a war, but money is also the thing we put into our, the pockets of our soldiers to make them want to fight and to put food on their families' tables. Yes, we need men, but money is just as important. Bringing me to my second point of analysis, that the economy is slowing, driving people to become more aggressive. Well, the European Union's team of economists states that we're seeing a global economic slowdown. An example of this in our own lives is picking one of our favorite of the $5 generals in Louisville and getting an overpriced carton of eggs, or driving shortly down the road to get a very overpriced gallon of gas. These problems are on a small scale in our country, but reach across the entire world. The economy is slowing, but the Global Guardian states one factor going into that isn't just inflation. It is the current state of our trade war. It cites things like Houthi bombings in the South China Sea, China using other non-lethal methods such as water cannons to corrupt cargo, and private waters being infringed on by the need for international trade. This problem is hitting the world by storm, and our money is just as important as men because it drives those men to fight. Al Jazeera, a well-known foreign news source, states that Russia is facing allegations of North Korean involvement being paid for arms and ammunition. With Russia sending aid through their economy to North Korea, it is just one of the many examples of a small, low, lower economy looking to a more active and aggressive way of income. Now, we do not want fighting across the world, because when we look at these large, overarching problems such as conflict and money, we lose sight of why we are fighting our own people. The third point of analysis is the idea that our people are more divided, leading to the fall of nationalism. In a poll done by the World Report, it said that 57% of international citizens interviewed believe the world is more divided over ideological issues. Now that would be things like race, religion, political preference, and even gender. These problems are hitting the world, our government, our cities, and our schools. These are doing nothing but 
more divided, and our countries are not supported well enough to fight on behalf of their own people. This problem cannot go on. It can only be labeled as unacceptable, like the New York Times stated just last year. This unacceptable standpoint of our people and our agreements cannot go on. Because if our countries are not supported and our people do not want further action, then how can we keep peace or win an upcoming war? This is leading to more divides in Congress and in countries around the world. With World War III being inevitable, these people are divided, making it harder for their countries to work against it. So in conclusion, we have to ask ourselves how these three things prove that it is inevitable. Well, first, are happening around the world and are being driven by the slowing of our economy. And finally looked at our people and its division leading to our countries not being supported enough to take full action. So after looking at manpower, money, and people, it is clear that the war is not only inevitable, but it's already in the works and its operations are upon us.
aspect is also a huge part of the function that social media serves. These ads can be used to slide into your crush's DMs, try to get the attention of a famous celebrity, or to receive creepy messages from old men. Ugh. Well, these sites make it easier to stay in contact with your friends and family.
part of my life from the early years of having to deal with it in its entirety to taking drastic measures in my teen years to now battling severe anxiety on a daily basis because of it. Situational anxiety disorder of communication which affects around 1 in 150 younger children and 1 in 1,000 adolescents. A person with SM is phobic of initiating speech or being overheard in the proximity of a given trigger. What is wrong with you? Children with 
life of nudism often have tremendous difficulty initiating and may hesitate to respond even non-verbally. This can be quite frustrating as time goes by. The child's non-verbal communication may go on for many years, becoming more ingrained and reinforced unless the child is properly diagnosed and treated. I have to figure out for myself what is wrong with me. If my selective mutism was not diagnosed in childhood, ASM is like living with your boss trapped in your mind. It's feeling alone. It's not being able to explain because you don't fully understand it yourself. Hey, wants me to speak. <laughs> While selective mutism is an anxiety disorder often associated with young children, teens and adults can also suffer from SM. In many cases, teens with SM have been struggling with anxiety for years. Most people only see the shell. Assume that I am aloof and uncaring because I am quiet.
Cellos first. They will be speaking on the topic, a bill to legalize physician-assisted death. The historical example in all of human history in terms of democracy is our belief in individual freedoms. And rather that those individual freedoms be expressed in our fight against the British in 1776, or in more modern terms, the right to a physician assisted death. And because of these personal liberties, we must vote in the affirmation for two key reasons the reduction of American suffering and the provision of a dignified death. Which brings me to my first contention that this bill will reduce suffering. I would like to open with a story of Abdullah, brought to you by Human Rights Watch. Abdullah was a four and a half year old when he was admitted into the hospital with severe bone cancer. This four year old suffered for six months in a hospital bed with nurses stating, quote, he screamed every day. Cancer so severe that the tumors popped bones out of place and whole parts and limbs out of sorts. If this bill was passed, that suffering would have never have happened. And that's why I stand in the affirmation. But this story is not unique. In fact, for over 300,000 cancer patients across this great nation, every day they are hospitalized with over 70% having what is quoted as severe pain by Michigan State University. This pain can be avoided and their suffering ended by their consent to a legal physician death, which is brought by this bill. And as such, we must affirm to stop the suffering of our constituents and to allow the lives of our patients to die dignifully. Which brings me to my second contention. This bill allows for a dignified now, the, the National Institute of, of Health tells us that a loss of hope and dignity is all too common in terminally ill patients. This is due to many reasons, but as the American Journal of Psychiatry tells us, it's mainly due to the loss of autonomy, an increase in suffering, and extreme pain. This often leads many patients to be utterly helpless, believing that there is simply no way out for their pain. And because of this, an alarming 80% will turn to suicide. Now, sadly, they have to turn to this, but even more sadly, they never succeed, with only 20% having a successful suicide. They're normally found undignified with a failed suicide on the floor of their hospital rooms. This bill prevents this, because it allows their passing to be peaceful, to be painless, and most importantly, to end their suffering, which if we don't pass, they will attempt to do themselves. We pass today because in the words of John F. Kennedy, the great thing about our nation is our ability as Americans to come together. We must come together and pass this bill to ensure individual rights in the modern era and to ensure that those suffering of cancer and terminally ill illnesses have the right to a dignified, painless, and above all, legal death. Thank you. I'm now open for cross next. Representative, can Dr. Sadiq please historically get things wrong? Sure, Representative. So, could a doctor diagnose something wrong to lead to people incorrectly killing themselves due to this bill? Well, Representative, as a stipulation of the bill, two physicians must approve of the death, and it is the consent of the patient knowing that the doctors and doctors may have made a mistake. Regardless if a doctor is right or not, it is the ability of the patient to choose to undergo the procedure or to not, adding to the clause of personal liberty as I stated in my speech. Thank you, Representative. How many termi Ill, terminally ill patients are suffering? Somewhere around 300,000. So would you really say that that is truly enough to justify the passing of this bill? Absolutely. 
absolutely representative, and this is because, as I stated, it is the job of this Congress to ensure that our Americans are the most well off, and above all, give them the personal choice in which they want to do with their lives, rather that be to pursue it or overall to end it. So we need to pass today to ensure that for those 300,000 who are suffering in hospitals, they have a legal way out of their suffering. Thank you, Representative Martin. I am Representative Anna, and I will be speaking on the negation of this bill. So I will begin when I can get the stool out of my way. Great. <laughs> Jake, are you ready? OK. According to a statistic by the United States Space Force, 100% of people that are actively living will someday die. Now, while we can all joke about death in some form, it is clearly a serious topic. With the affirmation stating that 300,000 people are suffering every single year, it is clear that an alleviation of suffering is definitely necessary. And while I agree with the affirmation on alleviating suffering and providing dignity, I think it's important to recognize that this legislation will only cause problems and is thus why I negate. I stand in negation of this legislation for two key reasons. One, the fact that the U.S. is simply not equipped to handle this legislation, and second, the fact that the rich will die with dignity while the poor continue to suffer. But let's look at my first point of contention, the fact that the U.S. is simply not equipped. According to the Harvard Medical School, the U.S. healthcare system is expensive, complicated, dysfunctional, and broken. This is because access is uneven and investments in healthcare are often misconstrued. They're put in wrong systems and they clearly don't work effectively. So why should we be giving more power to these systems when they only cause more problems? The answer is we absolutely shouldn't be, partially because of the medical malpractice that was mentioned in questioning of the affirmation speaker. According to PBS News, between 210,000 and 400,000 people will die every single year in the United States because of medical malpractice. If medical malpractice can make an error on how long someone has left to live and how much pain they can truly be in, it might convince our constituents that they have no option but to accept physician-assisted death. It is clear to see that constituents shouldn't be blindsided by medical malpractice caused by doctors and is partially why I negate. But I also negate this legislation because the rich will die with dignity and the poor will die suffering. According to the U.S. Census Bureau in 2023, 37.9 million people are actively in poverty. And the costs of medication that can be responsible for physician-assisted death are somewhere between $300 and $20,000. I don't know about you, but $300 isn't very easily findable in a poverty-stricken home. The poor people under this legislation will not be given any opportunity to alleviate their suffering, and thus, we should negate. The insurance business explains that bribery and corruption have become a reputational threat in the medical field. And with rich people being able to successfully afford a physician-assisted death while leaving the poor to suffer, it is clear to see that we should negate this legislation. While I agree that the Space Force can make claims of the 100% of people who may die, it is important to recognize that in order to protect the people that could be suffering, we should be negating legislation that only causes more problems. While I agree that people like Abdullah should not have to suffer, Representative Martin, I believe that in order for America as a whole to not have to suffer, we should negate this legislation and pass better, better legislation moving forward. I negate this bill. Thank you. volatility is between $300 and $20,000. Isn't that a pretty wide range of indicative of inaccuracy? While this wide range can definitely be indicative of inaccuracy, seeing as how it is almost always necessary to assume the worst in any situation, it is clear to see that expensive drugs should not be the thing that causes people to have physician-assisted death when poverty-stricken people can't afford it. Wishing him good luck. 
Vision. I first met Larry Nasser when I was somewhere around the age of five years old. Him and his wife Stephanie have become close family friends with my parents. They were all medical professionals and shared a passion for the subject. We shared sporting events, holidays, and many weekends in between. It was during this time, I was approximately six years old, that Larry Nasser began to sexually abuse me. First, exposing himself to me in the dark boiler room of his basement. He told me, if you ever want to see this, all you have to do is ask. In January of 2018, Larry Nasser was tried for the sexual assault of at least 265 young women and girls under the disguise of medical treatment. Most of his victims were members of the United States National Women's Gymnastic Team or other Olympic athletes. But Kyle Stevens wasn't an athlete. She was a close family friend and babysitter to his three young children. This making it even more difficult for her to come forward and testify against him. His first victim. This is her testimony. Over a six year period, he progressed from exposure to masturbating in front of me. All of which had happened with my parents, siblings, his wife, and his children in the same house. But let me remind you of a few interests of a six year old girl. My favorite TV show was Clifford the Big Red Dog. My favorite book was Judy B. Jones, and I still hadn't lost all of my baby teeth. I think we can all agree that someone at this maturity level should not be sexually active. But I was. Without my knowledge or consent, I had engaged in my first sexual experience by kindergarten. I was 12 years old when I told my parents. They confronted him and he denied such actions, so they chose to believe him. I spent the years between 12 and 18 avoiding and detaching from my family. But to my father, someone who makes such heinous, false accusations is the worst type of person. His belief that I had lied seeped into the foundation of our relationship. Every single time that we would get into an argument, he would tell me that I needed to apologize. It wasn't until I was getting ready to leave for college when he again put that need to apologize card and I took another chance of clearing my name. Larry's actions had already caused me significant anguish. But it hurt worse as I watched my father realize what he had put me through. Me and my father did our best to patch up what tattered relationship we had left before he committed suicide in 2016. Larry Nasser managed to wedge himself between myself and my family and used his leverage as my parents' trusted friend to pull us apart until we fractured. Fractured we did. My relationship with my mother is still marbled with pain, anger, and resentment. For a long time, I told people that I did not have a family. And I think it's important to know what my relationship with the Nassers was after I had accused him at age 12. A year or two had passed from when I accused him to our families beginning to spend time together again. I was around 14 years old when Stephanie had begun pressuring me into babysitting the Nassers' three young children. I had responded with dismissive answers for a lengthy period of time before relenting. I was confused. At home, I was a liar. But when I was with the Nassers, it was as if I had never accused him. I began to feel like I was losing my grip on reality. I began to question whether the abuse had ever actually happened. Because of this, I forced myself to go through the abuse step by step and night after night just to remind myself that I was not the liar. It is to this that I credit my ability to recall the abuse so very well throughout this process. As I continued to babysit for the Nassers, I began to feel resolved to my purpose there. With two young girls in the house, I felt protective, and that somehow my presence there 
care was making a difference. For seven years, I cared for those children with my whole heart. My detachment from my family had forced me to search for grants, to participate in post-traumatic studies, and babysit for the Nassers to pay for my own counseling. When I look back now, I realize that my spirit was broken. But then all I could think of was that I needed to be there for those kids. It wasn't until I was 21 years old when I had finally cut all ties with the Nassar family. You know, all of these feelings of shame and self-hatred have brought me bouts of depression and anxiety. You know, sometimes I think it's hard for people to translate these generic terms of reality. You see, for me, it was a girl crying on her bedroom floor for hours, trying not to rip out too much of her hair. For me, it was a girl waking up four months to the thought of wanting to die. For me, it was a girl getting out her gun and laying it on her bed just to remind herself that she was still in control of her own life. Sexual abuse is so much more than disturbing physical acts. It changes the trajectory of a victim's life. And that is something that no one has the right to do. After my parents confronted you, they brought you back to my house to speak with me. Sitting on my living room couch, I listened to you tell me that nobody should ever do those things to me. That if they do, I should tell someone.
Next up is junior Maddie Bigup. Maddie has placed top 10 consistently through the season and champs the Tusky Valley Tournament. She is always striving to improve, has a fantastic attitude, and her hard work has definitely paid off. Here she is with her piece, A New Hope. Into the Millennium Dot. 
Atkins has completed this goal several times over. And every morning when I get out of bed, I tell the world, never tell me the odds of my success. OK, it's more like, never tell me the odds, please. Shorter and simpler tasks. So I'm not limited by. 
my time or energy. Then I am not only motivated by having clean clothes, but also by imagining the accomplishment I will feel after completing each small task and then the overall goal in a timely manner. Finally, let's all take a few deep breaths. Come on, I know you've had a long day. There you go. No more sympathetic nervous system. By taking a few deep breaths, you automatically slow down your breathing and heart rate, deactivating the rest of the symptoms of the sympathetic nervous system. After all this is done, hope improves on its own, creating plans and motivation in even just one area of our lives to spiral to the rest, creating the foundation for how our lives
Four nine six six oh five oh. Someone's a little enthusiastic. <laughs> You just won $114.15.